Um, good evening, Refuge Church. Once again, God is good. And all the time. That's right. God is good. He got Jennifer and Annabeth and I home safely Thursday evening. Uh, praise God. We had a wonderful flight. Annabeth was kind of concerned. It was her first uh, airplane ride. She was really concerned about the turbulence. And about 30 minutes into flight number one, he gets on the radio and says, I'm putting the seatbelt light on. We're going to be hitting some turbulence. And Annabeth looks at me and Jen and she goes, okay. And we, we said, all right, we're going to hit some turbulence. Okay. We get into it and the plane's going whoo, whoo, and rumbling and it stops. He turns light belt, the, the seatbelt off and, Jen, and Annabeth turns to us and goes, that's it. <laughs> she goes, can we do it again? <laughs> so she was telling everybody her favorite part of the plane ride was the turbulence, exactly what she was scared of. Um, but how, how much is that like God? That the things we're so scared of, we're so nervous about, we're so afraid to move into, and we get into and we go, man, God, can we do that again? Man, that ride is amazing, isn't it? Um, but yeah, so we, we got there safely. We had a, a great family time. And thank you. Uh, I know you guys were praying for us and thinking about us. And I, I truly appreciate that. So we're going to talk about another name of God this evening. And we're going to start off in a way that, you know what? We've had a little bit of a weird night, and that's okay. And this is probably just going to get a little more weird. Um, and that's okay. I've spoken about a lot of things from the pulpit, so I doubt anything's going to really surprise you. Um, so... We sang a song this evening called El Shaddai, and that is the name we're going to talk about. And that's a really important name that God has, El Shaddai. <clears throat> and so when I was going through this, and you know, I, I, many of you know I'm taking a biblical Hebrew class right now, and it's really interesting, but we hadn't gone over specific names yet. And as I was going through there, I was looking at the root word um, of some of the names for God. And what popped out at me here was the root word within uh, Shaddai is the Hebrew word shod. And the Hebrew word shod is the word for breast, specifically pertaining to breastfeeding. And I thought that was really amazing. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, if we don't know, some of the details about what that is and about how important it is. Um, for, for a woman or a mother to do that with her child. So I looked into what is the main purpose of breastfeeding. On the surface or on the basic or simple answer to this is to provide a baby physically what it needs to survive, right? It needs to eat. It needs nourishment. Well, that's where it gets it. It gets it through that amazing process that the Lord designed um, for mammals at least um, to be able to get food and nourishment from its mother. It's a pathway that an infant can eat and receive sustenance. But if when you go further into it, it's more than just physical survivability. And that's the amazing part. Um, <clears throat> on the physical part, just real quick, it's breast milk is made up of protein, fats, sugars, and water. All things that are needed for a human child to grow physically, to mature physically, uh, their organs and the processes that are working in the body, and to be provided with the necessary antibodies that the baby needs to fend off sickness and disease and things that may happen in the outside world outside of the womb. So in order for them to be kept healthy, um, it needs this. The biological and anatomical process of breastfeeding besides the physical though is what happens when a baby suckles and when a baby suckles it stimulates the, the area and the complex structures inside that area of a woman and it triggers the release of a hormone called oxytocin and this hormone is an essential um, chemical or, or in the body that is um, that's part of um, the development is part of uh, human behavior, uh, reproduction. It's an essential, pretty much a, essentially a chemical messenger, we'll say, right? So it, it takes information and it brings it to different places so that the body can use it in its development or in human behavior and how our minds work. Some of the effects that it has, um, a type of emotional or a mood stimulation of the brain that contributes to relaxation, trust, Psych psychological stability, reduction of stress responses, including anxiety. It also induces an emotional sense of safety and high levels of social sensitivity. It blew my mind. 
You know, we think about that process. The baby's got to eat physically. It needs something to sustain itself, to, to, to give it nourishment physically. But it's not only physical nourishment the baby's getting, but it's getting mental nourishment, social nourishment, emotional nourishment. That process where a baby is at the mother's breast is, I don't know if you've ever seen a baby lay there, and many women I'm sure have, but if you didn't have the opportunity to do that with your child, I know different reasons some women can't, but if you've ever seen that, man, when a baby gets done feeding, there is no waking that baby up, right? They go into a food coma, right? They fall asleep like this, right? They just flop. And you could, I remember when and Jennifer would do with Annabeth, and it was the most amazing and most beautiful things I got to witness. And Annabeth would lay there, and I could literally raise her arm, and it would drop. Like, it didn't even affect her. And so there was this sense of security at her mom's bosom. There was this sense of nothing in the world mattered. Nothing was wrong. Everything was right. When we go, and I want us to hold on to that process, hold on, hold on to what we just learned. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the milk that's, that's produced, the process of feeding and the, and the milk itself being fats and sugars and proteins and all of this are the literal pieces that that child needs to develop in every way possible, right? Whether it's amino acids, whether it's um, the process of the tongue and the head and the skull, um, the way the synapses in the brain are firing, all of that stuff. Those proteins and the fats and all, it's taken out of the blood of the mother as it's produced inside the glands. So it's coming out of the very life force, the very the, the blood as we see it, the, the life of the mother is being transferred into this um, product that the baby has. And so when we say El Shaddai and we say Shad, it's no wonder that they're connected. Because El Shaddai as a name for God means all powerful, almighty, all sustaining, all sufficient. When a baby is at its mother's bosom, it is all sufficient. It needs nothing else. Literally, that baby could stay there 24-7, and besides being changed, it literally would not need another thing to be sufficiently, to be satisfied, not satisfied in a want, but satisfied in its needs. And I, I find it interesting that it connects to God because when we stay at God's bosom, when we stay on his chest, when we stay close to him, that's all we need. That's that's the sustaining part. That's it's sufficient. It's sufficient. Most often in scripture, when we see this name translated as almighty or all power, all sufficient, it's ironic that it oftentimes, when we see that, it goes to reproduction in scripture. Or what they're talking about blessings or children or, or seed going out when we talk about Abraham, the words used. Um, it's most used, 67% of the time, I believe it's said in the Old Testament, is through the story of Job. When he reminds Job, I'm the almighty. When Job's friends are there saying they refer to God as the Almighty, the All Sufficient One. The terms Almighty and All Powerful, when we see them or, or when we come across them, the initial thought, and even for me, is we think about it in the terms or in the context of perspective as force or strength, right? Oh, He's All Powerful. This is what we think of. All powerful, he's strong, he's mighty, he's a fortress, nothing can move him. But it's more than that. When we say God is almighty, that means he is all able. He is all capable, not just strong, not just able to break down a wall, but he is all sufficient and able to provide what we need, to provide the way, to provide comfort, to provide a soft shoulder. In medicine, we would refer to this characteristic as holistic, meaning to care for the whole person, not just one or a specific aspect such as physical, mental, and emotional, but to care for the entire person as a whole. It would be holistic health care. And God is in the business of holistic care for us. He doesn't just focus on one thing. It's not that we go to him and say, well, Lord, we need help on this. Well, I don't do that. Sorry. 
Oh, you need to go to the doctor for that problem. Well, you need to you need to find a good lawyer on that one. Sorry, you know, that ain't really in my wheelhouse. No, he is all sufficient, all aspects. This name of Almighty um, that we are looking at, all powerful, almighty ability to provide and sustain includes the power also to not just provide and sustain, but we have to remember when we're talking about Almighty, it's the uncomfortable part because we want to think that he's there with his big cosmic hug and he softly looks at us with gentle eyes all the time. But Almighty means he also has the ability to destroy and to do away with. And that's important, especially when we think about the strongholds in our lives the chains of bondage that the enemy tries to strap to us, that he's not hugging them away. In a blink of an eye, he is destroying those things. The Greek word um, for power is, and I may chop it up a little bit, is I believe it's dudamis is the way it's pronounced. And it's the same word we get for dynamite. The Lord's power is like dynamite. He doesn't, softly and gently speak it away, although he probably could. He does it with power and with force. Our words and, and the spoken word in general has an effect. When Annabeth was dealing what she was dealing with and she was back there afraid and, and, and concerned and she kept saying, I can't, I can't. And I, I told her, Annabeth, words have power. Words have power. The spoken word has power. Have you ever sat with your Bible on your quiet time? And I know it's easy when we do this to sit with our Bibles at quiet time. And we sit there and we just kind of quietly read to ourselves. We take it in, right? I challenge you this week, and this isn't our weekly focus. We're not done yet. But I challenge you this week when you're in your quiet time and reading, read that word out loud. Read scripture out loud. Speak it out. Speak it into, into the atmosphere. There is power in the spoken word of God. That's why in the Jewish synagogues, when the disciples would go in, when Jesus would go in, he didn't go in and say, okay, guys, let me sit in the corner and read, read scripture real quick. No, he walked up to the pulpit of the synagogue and read the scroll out loud. He read the word of his father out loud. Words have power. Our spoken word, our testimonies, as we've talked many times, have power. They have an effect. But as we talk about these two aspects of El Shaddai, Almighty, All-Powerful, the Sustainer, as well as the destroying aspect of it, I want to pull out two scriptures and land on them for a little bit with us this evening into the New Testament. Um, we have landed a lot in the Old Testament, and I'm so grateful and blessed for that because I spend a lot of time in there reading and looking and learning and researching and, and remembering the history and, and where our Savior came from but I have not spent a lot of time preaching out of it. And I have been so blessed that the Lord has taken us through series that really land in the Old Testament. But it's really important that when we land in the Old Testament, that we build a bridge from the Old Testament and into the New Testament, right? Because we want to look at the Old Testament through the lens of Christ, right? We don't live in the law anymore. We don't live in our history. We are not bound by what has happened and neither is scripture. Scripture is, it's good to learn. It's good to be aware of because if you're aware of your history, you won't fall back into the same traps and things like that. But we want to dive into the New Testament. And so we're going to first take it 1 Corinthians 12, 19. I'm sorry, it's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I remember that was a typo. Um, but just for context, right here we meet where Paul is talking. And he's talking about a thorn in his side that will not go away. He has prayed and prayed and prayed about it. And it is just persistent. Um, there's a lot of different uh, theories out there of what this thorn was. A lot of people think that it was an effect of being stoned that he was talking about. Um, specifically when he came, um, went through Antioch and, and all of that. And it says, I can't remember the name of the town, but he was leaving there. And he did many signs and wonders with uh, the people that were with him. And the Jews came in uh, trying to manipulate it and get the people against him. And it says they took up rocks and they stoned him. And a lot of people think that instance of going through that first missionary journey um, of Paul's is where he got the injury, which is a thorn in his side. And if you know what stoning is, and I, I don't mean the stoning that is now legal in New Jersey. I mean the stoning that people literally pick up rocks and whip them at you as hard as they can. Um, they said in this particular time that Paul was stoned to the point that they all left assuming he was dead. 
assuming he was dead. I, I implore you to, to go into that story in Acts and read it. Um, I believe it's Acts 14 or 15, but I, I implore you to read it. It's a, it's a very good read of just that whole first missionary journey that he took. Um, but they did. They assumed he was dead. And it says that the believers, <laughs> the people he was just talking to, came around him to pray, and he got up. <laughs> and so here's this man. He gets up. And you know what he did? He started preaching again. Boy, to have the faith of that. But either way, um, so he's talking about this, this thorn in his side here. And in, in his prayer of it, he hears the Lord say to him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. I'll be honest, as someone suffering, to hear someone say, well, my power is made perfect in weakness. Sounds kind of sadistic. Maybe even borderline narcissist. Like, you want me to go through all of this just so you can be perfected? Like, God, what, what's up? But that's not what God is saying. What God is saying there, it's when we as human beings in our nature finally get pushed to the point that there's no options. That's when we finally take our pedaling hands off of it and we let the Lord work, right? I'm guilty. I'm sure we all are. And I think a lot of times I'm, I, I've seen it, I've done it. You know, it's, Lord, man, it, this test is coming up and, and I don't know what my health is going to happen and please give discernment and give, right? We pray that all the time. And, and all of a sudden the doctor goes, hey, a brand new medicine was made for this. We're going to give it to you. It's going to take care of everything. And you go away going, man, Lord, thank God you didn't need to get involved. Doctor had a medicine. The Lord's going, right. Doctor had medicine. <laughs> Or, man, Lord, finances are tight this month. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm, the, the math ain't mathing. And uh, I might need you to follow through. And that job went through. And that check came in in time. You're going, oh, man, Lord, thank God I didn't need your help on this one. The check came in on time. And God's going, did you ever think maybe I had a hand in that? <laughs> right? And that's what God's talking about. When we get to the point that we are so weak, that we are so drained, that we are so at the, past the last straw, the straws are gone, the rope is, has been completely depleted, we are on free fall, falling through the depths, and we go, God, I've got nothing left. And he goes, yes, you have nothing left. Yes, you finally don't have an answer. Yes, you are finally out of ideas. Now I can get involved. That's what God's talking about. It's not that his power isn't perfect already. It's that our perspective is too clouded with our own ideas that we don't see his perfect plan in front of us. That's what he's saying. He is saying, I, my power is made perfect, proven to you when you finally get out of my way. Right? He's not being as harsh as I am. But he was telling Paul, Paul, listen, through this, you're going to see me work because you won't be able to do what I'm going to have you do with the disability you've got, with whatever that's plaguing you. I'm going to keep you humble. I'm going to keep you focused on me instead of focused on you because Paul is going to go out from this point and he's going to do miraculous things through the Christian, or not Christian at the time, through the people of the Jewish people and the Gentiles and bringing people together and being a part of that process. How easy um, would it have been to get full of himself? It said in that same story that I just recounted in Acts that he was doing things so wonderful that the people from the temple of Zeus came down to worship him. They wanted to sacrifice to him because they said, oh, this must be another reincarnation of Zeus and Hermes. Let's worship them and, and give them sacrifices. And how easy in his human nature could he have said, huh, maybe it is me. You know, I had training as a Pharisee. Maybe I picked up a thing or two. I talk pretty well. He could have easily gotten pretty. Heads get big, pretty big without us noticing. Before we know it, we don't fit out the door and we're wondering why. And this, this, this prick, this thorn kept that head from getting just too big. Right? And so he goes on to say, Paul goes on to say in that uh, 1 Corinthians passage, he says, man, I rejoice now because of it. I am paraphrasing. I rejoice that this is happening because it's keeping me where I need to be with God. It's helping my relationship. 
But the El Shaddai part of it, the Almighty, the All-Powerful, the Sustainer, God's saying, my grace is sufficient. What I'm providing for you, that's all you need. That is the breast milk that is going to sustain you. You don't need to go look somewhere else. You don't need to worry. I'm giving you all you need. I'm giving you everything that you think won't come. If it don't come, it's because you don't need it. If it don't come, it's because I'm going to provide something greater. We not only receive that which strengthens us and helps us grow, but we also receive what is needed to fend off and protect against the attacks and tactics of the enemy, right? Just like breast milk re, re, uh, produces antibodies in a baby, that's where they get their immunity protections from. Us staying close to our Father allow us spiritual antibodies. It allows us to discern, to recognize, and to ward off the attacks of the enemy. And remember, that enemy don't come with a spear and a sword and a shield looking in red armor with a tail flapping behind him and horns sticking out. He ain't coming like that. He's coming with that subtle temptation, with that, you got this. Remember how you overcame it last time? Remember that check came in the mail right on time? What do you need God for? Come on, you got this. You went to school. You have a degree on the wall. You put all your time and effort into it. You are so smart. You are so resilient. That's the temptation. And you know what? Maybe the Lord did make you smart. Maybe he did make you strong. But as I think I've mentioned from here and maybe in personal conversations with many of you, after the walls of Jericho fell down, came Ai. The little town that the Israelites went, we don't need the Ark of the Covenant for that one. We just took down the walls of Jericho. And God went, you did what? <laughs> Who took those walls down? If I remember correctly, you marched around that thing playing music. What did you do? And they went into Ai thinking they were all that in a bag of chips, as the old saying used to go. And they turned around with their tail between their legs and they marched back to camp crying because they lost and they lost miserably. Miserably. It wasn't even close. And that's the temptation that we fall into so easily. So easily. So we have to lean on the Lord. We have to remember to stay connected in Him. To be aware of His presence in our lives. That we are laying down. That we are taking the time to be nourished in His arms. So that when we're full, we can fall into a spiritual food coma. Just like the baby, just lay in God's arms because it doesn't matter what's going on in the world around us. Because <laughs> we're in his arms. Doesn't matter. Nothing, nothing's important. God's power is made in weakness. Does not mean that the Lord looks on us with a blind eye, but that we are confident in the power that he has. In Luke 23 and in Matthew 27, there's another instance that we will see El Shaddai. And in this instance is one of the most amazing aspects of the Lord breaking down bondages and strongholds. I would go to say in the entirety of scripture. Because what this talks about is a stronghold that no human being could ever overcome. In human history, there has never been a mineral, a metal, or a substance that man could not find a way to overcome it, break it, tear it down, blow it up, or destroy it. At times in history, we would say many things were unbreakable, shatterproof, or even unsinkable. And it would all prove to be exactly what they claimed they weren't. With each one, it was only a matter of time. And the most recent one that I can think of in my lifetime was um, what was built between 98 and 2008, and it's the Large Hedron Collider. It is a particle machine that can um, split atoms and mash things together on a particle level that blows my mind of understanding. I couldn't even begin to explain it to you, and I won't try. But I remember when growing up as a kid, they went, atoms, the smallest thing, nothing can get smaller, nothing can break it or blow it up, or, and nothing splits atoms like they're butter.
However, there's one thing that is unbreakable, 100% impenetrable. There was not, there is not, and there will never be anything that we as a species, as man, with all of our intelligence, our technology, our know-how could ever break through, tear it down, or tear it apart. And this item was 60 feet long, 30 feet wide, and four inches of fine linen. You go, Pastor, I can cut linen with a steak knife. And I would say you're right. But this one, this particular one, stood for the impenetrable wall that stood between God and us, between creator and creation. Because after the fall and after Adam um, and Eve fell, there was a huge separation that was made between us and him. And I'm going to read out of Matthew um, 27. And it's verses 50 to 53. If you want to follow along. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, speaking of Jesus on the cross. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. I think a lot of the times when we read the crucifixion story, we forget that there was a night of the living dead that day or an afternoon of the living dead. Could you be imagine? You just buried Uncle Tom and you were mourning him and this man Jesus dies on the cross and here comes Uncle Tom walking in out of the tomb going, hey guys, that had to have been a mighty scene. So when we talk about people that say, oh, the crucifixion never happened, it's a fable, it's a story, no way. I'm sorry, but that's a memorable experience that anybody would have experienced, would have absolutely remembered without a doubt in their head. And it happened to an entire city. It wasn't some Christians, no. It was Jewish people, Gentiles, believers and non-believers experienced this happening. But what I said in the beginning is, this destructive power, right? That if he is almighty and all powerful, he can tear down any stronghold, any chain, any bondage that we could possibly be under is no power, no strength, no fight for the creator. It was because he voluntarily left heaven. He humbled himself to his very creation. that broke down and tore the very thing we never could. It is what created the bridge. It is the vehicle that brought us back into the throne room of God. And it's not because he needs us. It's because he wants us. It's because he loves us. It's because he created us. And it's not simply creation because that means he would have made a way for the angels. And he didn't. We're not even his most powerful creation but we're his most special. We are not his most beautiful creation, but we are his most loved. We are not his smartest creation, but we are his most precious. And so he is El Shaddai, all-powerful, almighty, all-sufficient. Whether it is all sufficient in providing provisions and sustenance and the resources that we need to get through life, or is it all sufficient in tearing down the strongholds that we ourselves cannot break without him, he is all sufficient, period, end of story. The single greatest mention of the all-powerful and almighty characteristics of God are found in the first three words of Genesis. And there are three words when you read them in Hebrew, and it's Bereshit bara Elohim. And it means in the beginning God created. He is almighty. He is all powerful. He is all created. This earth, the heavens, and everyth everything in between. As we come into our weekly focus now, is God our El Shaddai? Do we approach and treat and trust him according to his eternal characteristics? 
when we pray to him, when we go to him, when we're sitting there going, man, Lord, what is going to happen? Are we treating him as he is all powerful? He is all sufficient. Is he all we need in our perspective? So once again, I'm going to say, as we did the last several weeks when I was doing names, be intentional and specific as you spend time with him. Call him by name. When you approach him this week, El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Speak your prayer out. Even if you're by yourself, if in your car, it's okay. Speak his name out. Whether it's being provided for, sustained and strengthened, or whether you are being delivered from a stronghold, or having his power made perfect through your circumstance, call him out by name this week. We're going to focus on he is almighty, all-sufficient. Let's go ahead.